Good evening and welcome to this last session of today. My name is Bastian Hofmann. And my name is Simon Pierce. Bastian and I both work for a company called Sys11. Sys11 is a full managed provider based in Berlin. We've been uh, with a strong focus on managed hosting. We've been offering managed hosting now for our clients for the last 11 years. And one product that we started this year is also managed Kubernetes on OpenStack. And today we want to talk about how you can scale and auto scale these Kubernetes clusters on OpenStack. The good thing about Kubernetes as a container orchestration platform is that it makes it very easy to scale your applications and services. Why do we want to scale? Yeah, why do we want to scale in the first place? There's uh, many answers to this question, and one of the answers could be to handle increased workload. Some of you may have encountered this uh, unfortunate event that one of your marketing guys sets up a big campaign and forgets to tell the sysop department. What is going to happen? Most probably, your application is going to crash. This is one of the reasons where auto-scaling and Kubernetes can help you. Another reason is maybe your financial department. You only really want to pay what you actually get and what you actually need to use. Resources are expensive on public clouds, and you probably don't want to book too many. Another reason could be you may want to help save the environment. So if we want now know that scaling is very important to reduce costs, to reduce energy consumption, we have to think about how we can scale our application. And there are two ways. The first one is horizontal scaling. Horizontal scaling means that you either increase or decrease the amount of instances of your application that are running or the amount of nodes in your cluster. The second one is vertical scaling. Vertical scaling means that you either increase or decrease the CPU or memory usage of one instance of your application, or that you increase or decrease the capacity in CPU and memory of one node in your cluster. If you want to do this on your bare metal infrastructure, the thing you have to do is first you have to probably order a new server, probably write a ticket to your data center, and then a couple of weeks later, if you're lucky, you have a new server delivered. Next, you have to put the server into a data center somewhere via all the cables, install an operating system on them, hopefully not Windows 95. And then, after that is done, you can start provisioning all the server with all the necessary dependencies with Puppet or Chef or any kind of other things to get the Java version on it or whatever you need for your application to run. And only then you can go to the fun part, deploying your actual service and your code to this new server and probably also reconfiguring the load balancer to get new traffic to this node and to this instance that you added. These are a lot of steps. And these ste steps also take some time, sometimes days in between. And if you want to scale up very quickly, because we have a TV commercial coming up, this is like way too slow. So um, next, we would like to look at the cloud provider approach. What is this process going to look like if we're using one of the public clouds? We could maybe start off with uh, creating a VM from an OS image. It could be something that's uh, pre-configured by your cloud provider and already there. Then we would also need to provision the server with the necessary dependencies that are needed to run my application. So same step again. And we also need to deploy these services to the new server. Reconfiguring the load balancer also needs to be done. So we've still got a lot of steps that we need to perform before we can actually get to our end result. Of course, then cloud providers say, yeah, we have these things called auto-scaling groups, which are kind of nice and in theory can help us with doing that by automatically booting up new VM images if the load increases. The problem with that is a lot of these auto-scaling group APIs are very proprietary. That means they are different for every cloud provider, and if you are on AWS, for example, and you now want to move to OpenStack, or you move, want to move some of your workloads to OpenStack, you have to implement that again and again. Kubernetes makes this a lot easier by just standardizing the APIs for that. So in, to show you a bit more, on, also in demonstration later on how this works, let's talk a bit how Kubernetes actually works internally. 
So uh, to start off with this, it's uh, quite important that we're talking about the same terminology that we all understand the Kubernetes basics that we're talking about. So to start off with, I would like to explain what is actually a container. A container normally runs a Docker image. It doesn't have to. There are other container runtime interfaces around that can be used. Normally, a container, as a good a standard practice, should run one process, one process only. There are, of course, child processes, which is processes going to fork, but otherwise, we should be talking about one process. There are a lot of bad examples around on Docker Hub, which maybe some of you have encountered, but this is normally the way it should be done. In the Kubernetes terminology, we often come across something called a pod. A pod can be one or multiple containers. Normally, we assume that we share certain things, like networking, for instance, because we need the same networking. We could also share the same storage if we wanted to. Not necessary, though. Here's an example of what a pod could look like. So if you look on the um, left-hand side, we have the uh, PHP uh, FPM container, which is uh, in front of it is our Nginx container running our web service. So the uh, PHP FPM would typically uh, connect to the Nginx container and send its uh, pre-compiled PHP data. And just to make sure that we've got a logging facility, we now have a sidecar which also belongs to this pod, which uh, is used to send on our logs to uh, Logstash, for instance. So just to give you a short overview of what a, a deployment YAML file may look like in Kubernetes. This is uh, the kind as a deployment. Um, we've got the API version. We've got the metadata of what we're actually going to deploy. And the actual container which is going to be pulled is the Nginx demo in version 0.2. If we don't state anything at all here, this image will automatically get pulled from Docker Hub. If we now have this deployment and we want to scale this horizontally, we can use a feature in Kubernetes called a replica set. So in this case, here we have uh, one pod running here, and we want to have this three times in our cluster. So in a replica set, we can define, hey, Kubernetes, please run it three times. And Kubernetes will then ensure that it's running in the cluster three times. And even if a node goes down where these containers would be running on, it will then reschedule the containers on some other node where there is available space. To give you an idea how this looks in code, we have our deployment. And basically, this deployment includes a replica set, which includes a pod definition. And with this replicas count, we can now tell Kubernetes, hey, run it three times. So the next thing we would like to talk about is vertical scaling. How can I use a vertical scaling for my containers? So we're normally talking about one container which we need to scale up because the process probably needs more CPU or more memory maybe. So in general, we're looking at a few fields which Kubernetes use for scheduling. We'll come back to this later on in one of our uh, demonstrations that we're going to show you today. And one of the uh, important fields we're talking about here is the actual resource request. The resource requ request is something that Kubernetes uses for its scheduling decision. That's important. So before a pod is actually scheduled, it checks the CPU and also the RAM that's been added to these two fields and looks for a node which has that capacity. If it doesn't find anything, then it will not be able to schedule that container or pod. So limit, uh, limit the container to use more CPU and memory, so it will not be able to use over that. These are values that can be changed manually. So you can basically edit your deployment, which we'll show you later, and you can change these. Of course, changing this manually is nice, that you can decide this at some point, yeah, I need like three replicas or I need like five CPUs for the service. But what you actually want to do is you want to change this also automatically based on usage, based on traffic that your services are getting. So that you don't have to get up at night uh, when there is like a tra spike in traffic and also that you don't pay too much if you don't need it. In the end, this is all about focusing on what's really important. And what's really important is not your infrastructure, but the applications that you're running on, because that's what's making money. So let's show this in a live demo. 
So, number one, we need uh, a few preparations to get this demo up and running. So, to do this, we're going to need a Kubernetes cluster, which we're going to try and get up and running in a few moments. And we would like to um, show you the difference between doing it yourself via a managed Kubernetes solution. Setting up and maintaining Kubernetes is hard. Who of you has set up Kubernetes themselves, like really the hard way? Okay, keep your hands up, who liked it? <laughs> okay, that's a bit what I expected. <laughs> it's definitely a difficult and a very tedious uh, pastime, and most people forget a lot of crucial components as well, or they do not back up the ETCD correctly and find themselves through uh, certain problems at the end of this. Monitoring can also be a crucial component that you're gonna need. A managed offering hopefully takes care of a lot of these and gives you a certain amount of carefree usage and a certain amount of take away certain jobs that you just don't want to do because who actually wants to focus on Kubernetes? Most people don't. Most people want to focus on their application. To name a few of the uh, popular Kubernetes managed offerings, we could talk about GKE with uh, one of the first managed offerings on the Google Cloud, Amazon with EKS, and SUS11 with MetaCube. So um, what are the advantages of having a managed solution? One of them definitely should be having easy upgrades. If you try and uh, run your Chef or your Ansible playbook to try and upgrade your Kubernetes cluster, you're probably going to be sitting there with sweaty hands hoping that everything works and that your containers are still running afterwards. And I've definitely broken a few clusters trying to do this. Easy scaling should also be something that you should take into consideration. You don't have to go to the rack like Bastian was uh, telling us earlier, or maybe you have to pre-order a server or something because your capacities have run out. On most public clouds, you can just uh, receive more uh, resources when you need them. Also, load balancing is uh, a big thing that people need to take into consideration. You need to be able to expose your services to the outside world because what are your services worth if they're just inside a Kubernetes cluster? So you're gonna need some form of load balancing, which you probably also do not have if you don't run on some form of managed offering. Distributed persistent storage. So you're talking about, okay, you need to manage all these hardware nodes, the Kubernetes installation, and now on top of that, I need a persistence layer, which I also need to take care of. We're talking about a lot of things to manage. And one of the last things that people often forget is backup. And even worse than that, recovery. Do they actually test their backups? Do they actually work? We've done a lot of this for you. Premium support is also something which can take away a lot of pain. If anything goes wrong with your application or you would need to talk about scaling, how things are done properly, best practices, you can come to us and we can talk about these sort of things. And mostly we have answers too. Monitoring is also one of the uh, key things that you need to actually properly set up and maintain a Kubernetes cluster. If you're not looking at your KPIs and you're not looking at certain um, things going in and out of your cluster, then it's just not going to work. And are you actually receiving these alerts? Are you getting paged correctly when things get triggered? So basically the key message is you can focus on what is important. So just to give you an idea how this can look like in a managed offering to set up a Kubernetes cluster, uh, instead of doing it the hard way with a thousand steps and uh, lots of documentation, you can just log in and sign in and then create a new cluster, give it a name, choose the Kubernetes version, click next one time, choose the region you're running in, provide your OpenStack credentials choose the OpenStack project where your nodes should be running in, choose how many nodes and which flavor should be running, add an SSH key maybe to it to be able to connect to them later on manually if you need it, click create, and then a few minutes later, you have the nodes up and running, which is a lot less than this Kubernetes the hard way. So if you have a Kubernetes cluster now, let's talk about how we can scale our workloads with that. And the first thing is, what we want to do is we want to show you how we can scale a pod, a single instance, with a replica set manually in a horizontal way. Okay, to do that, we're gonna switch to our first demo, hopefully. 
Uh, here it is. Uh, okay. And our first demo is we would like to show you how you can basically scale up a deployment. So let's see if we can, yeah. Uh, no, not delete. Deployment. So what we have already here, while Simon is typing, we are showing here on the top right side um, the pods we are running in our namespace of one deployment. In at the moment we have one instance. On the lower right side we are showing the CPU and memory usage of every pod that is automatically measured with <laughs> Kubernetes. Okay. And so, yeah. So we can see our deployment here. We've basically got a deployment with um, one uh, replica at the moment, and we should also have a service if we have a look. So if we look at the service, we have also a service with a type load balancer. The type load balancer should automatically give us a public IP. We can quickly check this, and we should have this public IP up and running here. But you also can see that the server name is automatically here the name of the pod. Uh, so it's actually like a live running demo, and we're not faking it. So. so if we want to scale this up now, we can use the kubectl scale command. Yeah. Oops, that's why it's not doing it. I one wasn't typing. So let's have a look. Yep. No, that's not it. Okay, sorry. Scale. That's it. Okay, so we can scale this deployment fairly easily from one replica up to uh, three replicas. So what you're going to see now is you should see new, uh, new containers or new pods getting spawned on the right-hand side. Uh, what's happened? Okay. Let's copy and paste this. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, why did it take that long? Okay. Okay, that's it. Okay, so you can see the containers coming up here on the uh, right hand side. And now we should see that uh, our deployment should have a desired state now of uh, three current containers, which is now running, or pods. And we could also scale that back down at any time we wanted to. We could also edit uh, this deployment. So, let's have a look. Yeah, edit the deployment hello world. So if we look through this uh, YAML, uh, we should have our replica count, which we saw earlier, which has now been set to three. The uh, scaler has done nothing else than to edit this. So we can now change this number to one again, edit it, uh, save the file, and then we should see the pods getting terminated again. Yeah, that's okay. happening. So um, this was manual scaling, which is already very nice, scaling of pods. Uh, the next thing we want to show you is how you can actually do this automatically if the load on the server or on the pods are being increased. So, so to do this, we can use something which is basically already built into Kubernetes, the uh, HPA, the Horizontal Pod Autoscaler. The Pod Autoscaler can be set to um, check certain metrics, the um, standard is to look for CPU. The standard is to look for uh, CPU. Basically, we're going to set this to a very low value now, to 5%. For um, demonstration purposes, of course, you would not do this in production, please. Um, we're going to uh, do this, and then we're going to create some load with uh, AB, with the uh, benchmarking tool from Apache, on this pod. And hopefully the metrics API should pick up the increased workload, which should fairly quickly hit the 5% uh, target that we're looking for. Once this happens, we should see the horizontal pod autoscaler uh, kick in. On the uh, left-hand side in the bottom, we're running a describe on that uh, HPA, and you should fairly easy, quickly see that this is going to um, start happening, hopefully. So it, it, takes, a, it takes a few uh, seconds for that to happen because it needs to uh, get the metrics data, and it's still at zero. So hopefully this will happen shortly. Let's, let's see what happens because we're trying to, to run this over a mobile connection, so it could be... Let's try the Wi-Fi. Okay, we'll just try the Wi-Fi then. Uh, 
from is that is always like mobile connection or something could limit the amount of requests we are getting uh, doing in parallel yeah. so to one host. So we need to get a certain amount of requests to that. Uh, so okay, connected to the Wi-Fi. Um, okay, let's have a go then. And let's show. Yeah, we can see um, the CPU scores have already uh, got increased. So you can see there's already a certain amount of load, which is over our 5%. And you can see on the other um, side that the first pods are already in a state pending. So they are, they're running now. So we've already increased the number of connections that we'll be able to accept for application without really doing anything, except setting up the HPA to a certain um, CPU limit. Okay, so this is horizontal port auto scaling. The next thing we want to show you, what if we actually vertically want to scale a process? Because it needs more resources, because we are getting OAMed all the time and one of our containers needs definitely more memory. For that, we need manual vertical scaling. Yep. So what we can do is we can edit the deployment again. And if we look down here to the pod definition, we see resources for requests for CPU and memory. And we can just increase that. Yeah. So let's see, where are they? It should be uh, a bit further okay. down. Oh yeah, there you can see, that's the request that we were talking about, which uh, Kubernetes, of course, uses for its scheduling decision. So if we edit those and increase the uh, CPU to use half a CPU and the RAM to 700 megabytes per container, we should find a certain amount of containers stuck in pending state. Yeah, so what Kubernetes is now trying to do, it does a rolling deployment of these containers from the specification with less CPU and memory requests to the specification with more. And now we see for this new um, replica set here, all these containers are impending. If we say kubectl describe pod and then this pod here, we also see why because um, it actually can't schedule these pods because there are insufficient memory and insufficient CPUs available in the cluster. So at the moment, in the current state of our cluster, Kubernetes, of course, would not be able to solve this problem because we have unschedulable resources. So we actually need to add more nodes to our uh, cluster to schedule additional pods. So what we could do is we could manually add more VMs to the cluster. This is, of course, a bit cloud provider dependent. Uh, at Sys11 Metacube, you can either do this over CLI or you can also do this in the nice interface where you can say, hey, add a node and the amount of nodes and what flavor they're in. What we're actually using under that is the Kubernetes Cluster Management API, which defines how you can interact with nodes in a cluster and abstracts the cloud provider specific things away. And with the Kubernetes machine controller that knows then how to st uh, talk to OpenStack, we can provision VMs on the fly easily. So what we're gonna show you in a minute is that we have a machine deployment there. The machine deployment manages rolling updates on a machine set. In the machine set, there is defined how many instances of nodes we wanna have in our cluster and every instance is the machine resource in Kubernetes. And then we have the machine controller that listens on these machine resources and then on demand creates or deletes OpenStack VMs, provisions Kubernetes on it, and makes them join the Kubernetes cluster as a node. So you could, of course, do this manually again, but also we wanna show you how to do this automatically with node auto-scaling. Yep. Um, so in, also in Metacube for OpenStack, we have implemented and extended the Kubernetes cluster autoscaler to talk with this cluster management API. This is ready in a way that we can show it to you now. It's not ready yet that we can actually open sources. We hope to do this like next week or so. So this will be available soon, at least as a pull request to the autoscaler. So let's...
So Have what we're going to show you next is we're going to show you how we can try and get these uh, pods out of its pending state and uh, deliver enough resources for our Kubernetes uh, scheduler to be able to actually schedule this. So what is the Node Autoscaler doing? It's looking for exactly this. It's looking for pods in a pending state which do not have sufficient resources to be scheduled. Once it finds these pods, it will try and provide us with some new machines. So on the uh, left side here, we have a watch on all the machines in our Kubernetes cluster that also then correlate to nodes in our Kubernetes cluster. And now we are adding a new machine deployment. We can say with annotations what the minimum size and maximum size of this deployment is for the autoscaler. So in this case, we have a minimum of zero nodes in this deployment and a maximum of 15 nodes. And we can also define rolling update strategies, like how many of these nodes should be maximum unavailable if I change the flavors, for example, to it. And also I can define all the necessary fields, like what operating system image I want to run, what flavor of, open, of VM I want to run here, what network and security group these nodes should be in, and so on. Uh, so if we apply this, So once we apply this, we'll have a new uh, machine deployment created, which then in turn will watch for this group, this uh, replica set. And once it's needed, it will start spawning new machines, which it's already done, because we already left uh, uh, an amount of pods in pending state. Yeah. So what you can also see, of course, booting up a new VM, that's quite fast for creating a new VM from the image. Provisioning it with a new kubelet means up get install of a couple of packages, installing, I think, Python and other things. So this is going to take like two to five minutes. Uh, depends what we also can see if we now run here OpenStack server list. That there are in my project already the uh, first machines the will be. VMs already there and they got public IPs and are now just waiting to join the cluster. Yeah, so that might take a while until they actually provision until everything's up and running and they've actually joined the master. So we'll finish off with our slides first and then we'll come back to this uh, demonstration at the end. So we saw the cluster management AI API and the demo. Okay, so we'd like to uh, give you a brief summary uh, to wrap up what we were talking about today so that you've got uh, a fair understanding when you leave our talk about what it's all about. So with autoscaling, you can save valuable resources if you need to, and most people want to do that. You can maybe even uh, help save our environment and make this place a better planet. Kubernetes makes autoscaling a lot easier because it has all the things on board that you actually need. We saw the horizontal pod autoscaler, we saw vertical scaling, and we also saw the node autoscaling, which can easily be integrated into a new cluster. And one of the best things about it all is you may save yourself from getting up at night because one of your applications is not working as it should be. Thank you very much. So we have a couple minutes for questions and we definitely can go also to the nodes later on and see them up and running. If you want to have questions now, feel free. And you can also join us in our uh, SIS11 lounge for beers later on and we also have a booth outside there where you can also answer any questions and you can also send us emails and reach us on Twitter. And yeah, if you have questions now, feel free. Okay. So if anyone would like to ask any questions later on, please drop by our booth. We'll be offering some beers later on. So just, yeah, just come around. Thank you.